Sergeant, uh, you may begin your recording. PC recording has started. Cloud recording is good. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Polite, let me begin with your statement. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on cultural affairs, libraries, and international intergroup relations. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. <clears throat> send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Here, yeah, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing. Uh, I am Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer, and I'm Chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. And not being in the chambers and having a gavel, I will formally uh, gavel us in using this beautiful owl, which is from my alma mater, Bryant High School in Queens. So we are formally in session. So libraries, of course, are the most uh, democratic and one of the most important institutions that we have in this world. And uh, the onset of the COVID pandemic has not only revealed uh, the extent to which people rely on libraries, but in this moment uh, where people are desperate for some sense of normalcy, uh, stability, safety, uh, and also craving information, information about the virus, what's happening in their world and in their community. And while libraries uh, are not as open physically uh, to some, they continue uh, and have always continued to provide invaluable services uh, in every way they could possibly imagine providing those services. And that's part of why we're here today. Uh, the libraries over the uh, 11 years that I've been the chair of this committee have provided testimony on a wide array of issues uh, serving the incarcerated, the census, the budget, technology, uh, but rarely um, have we had a hearing as consequential as this one. Uh, we haven't had a hearing solely dedicated to libraries and library services uh, since before the pandemic, we essentially closed the three systems uh, when in the second week of March, we all understood the severity of the situation. And, and I want to phrase the library systems for their concern and caution for their staff members uh, and for the public that they serve in, in acting quickly and responding to the moment that was incredibly challenging for everyone. And what we are interested in learning today is what happened uh, and what has been happening since that uh, awful week when we realized uh, the wave that was about to uh, crash over all of us. And how have libraries, which are and always have been brilliant at reinventing themselves uh, and, and figuring out new and better ways to deliver information and services and programs, doing that in this particular moment in time. And how are we meeting the needs of a public that is uh, home more, uh, not working uh, as much 
as they were because so many are unemployed, uh, hungrier than ever because so many are food insecure, um, people who are losing or in danger of losing their apartments, and people who are desperate for information about COVID, uh, and of course, the city uh, and its people looking for more and more places to get tested uh, for free in a place that is safe and welcoming and familiar uh, to them. So I know because I've participated in several programs with the Queens Public Library that uh, while some of it is uh, remote, uh, we're still doing Drag Queen Story Hour, we're still having Friends of Library conferences, um, library workers are uh, doing all they can. And of course we have the phase one opening with uh, plenty of grab and go and uh, some other uh, limited but important services going on. I also know that there are phase two plans uh, and I'm anxious to hear from the public libraries about those. Obviously the recent increase in positivity rates uh, are, are something that we all have to take seriously. And I know the three president and CEOs are doing so. So we're interested to hear how the current moment is impacting that, uh, those plans uh, to move forward with even more. Uh, these are extraordinary times uh, and these are uh, frightening times for many, but it is good to see uh, so many familiar faces. Uh, I hope you are all well uh, and, um, and all of your families are well as uh, also. Uh, I wanna recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Francisco Moya from Queens. And before we hear uh, from the um, President and CEOs, I want to thank my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, uh, the committee's finance analyst, Alia Ali, our policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney for all their hard work on all of these things. Lastly, I will just say, and, and perhaps the president CEOs will, will reference this, there was a, a cut to the library's budgets uh, in the adopted budget in June. And there are, there are some uh, who are wondering just how important libraries are today um, and, uh, and whether or not uh, you are still uh, delivering the life enhancing services and programs that you have for well over a hundred years. So clearly I believe you have and continue to do so and you're needed more than ever, but I'm certainly interested to hear from all three of you about uh, your current situation and, uh, and the future and what it looks like for you uh, what you're doing, but also in some ways what you are uh, hopeful about and what you are fearful of uh, from the city of New York, uh, the state of New York and the federal government. With that, uh, I will throw it back to the moderator for some very important words of guidance on the hearing and how we're gonna proceed. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, so we will start with going over some procedures for the hearing. Uh, I am Brenda McKinney, counsel to the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, the New York City Council, and I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on the panelists to testify. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call you to testify. After you, will, after you are called, you will be unmuted by the host. The library CEOs will remain unmuted muted during the Q&A portion of today's hearing. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes and council members please note that this includes both the questions and the witness answers. Please also note that we will not have a second round of questions at today's hearing. Finally, as we have not received any registrations from members of the public, there will be no public testimony portion for today's hearing. 
so with that, um, the council does not need to administer the oath to the libraries. Uh, so I will now call on the following representatives from the libraries to testify in the order that we will call them. Uh, first is Linda E. Johnson, president and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, followed by Anthony Marks, president and CEO of the New York Public Library. And finally, Dennis M. Walcott, president and CEO of the Queens Public Library. Additionally, for the record, the following representatives from the libraries will also be on hand to testify. Nick Higgins from the Brooklyn Public Library, Karen Sheehan from Brooklyn, and Iris Weinshall from New York Public Library. We also have Brian Bannon from the New York Public Library, Shannon Sharp from the New York Public Library, Sugmo Kim from the Queens Public Library, and Nick Buren from the Queens Public Library. So as a reminder, council members, please use the raise hand function in Zoom if you'd like to ask questions or speak. And with that, President Johnson, uh, I see that you are ready and you may begin your testimony when, when you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, it's nice to see all of you. I, I have to say I miss being flanked by my colleagues um, sitting at the table in those uncomfortable chairs. I even miss those chairs and the portrait of George Washington and his horse, which always makes me smile. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer, um, for giving us this opportunity to testify. Um, we've been running since March with our hair on fire and organizing our testimony and thinking about all that we've accomplished since March um, is both heartening and, and heartbreaking. Uh, and I'll explain more, but, um, but we deeply appreciate your support and, um, and the opportunity to talk about the work that we've been doing. Um, certainly a lot different than the last time we testified. Um, so thank you, um, Chairman Van Bramer and members of the committee, Majority Leader Cumbo and our Brooklyn delegation and the entire city council for supporting New York City's libraries throughout this extremely challenging year. We deeply appreciate your efforts to ensure that Brooklyn Public Library can continue to deliver services to the 2.6 million residents of our borough. This March, we were reminded just how essential our services are. For the first time in our history, our 124 year history, we were forced to close our doors, knowing how many patrons depend on us and how desperately they need the services and the community we provide, we found new ways to serve. With extraordinary speed and solidarity, our librarians and staff, and in particular, our information technology team, transformed Brooklyn Public Library into a largely digital institution. Between mid-March and September, we hosted more than 4,000 programs online with the same breadth as our in-person programming and the same aim, to foster, in to foster literacy, civic engagement, and social justice. For example, our 28th Amendment Initiative, which was originally slated to be held in our branches as well as schools and senior centers and homeless shelters, pivoted quickly to 32 Zoom town halls where hundreds of Brooklynites brainstormed the next amendment to the constitution. We created new programs in response to our community's needs. Energized by the Black, Matter, Black Lives Matter movement, Brooklyn Public Library has prioritized programs that foster dialogue about race and social equity and that center Black and indigenous writers and thinkers. All told, more than 700,000 people have tuned into BPL's virtual programs from Ready, Set, Kindergarten to Homework Help for remote students to Know Your Rights workshops, grief support groups, and personalized job assistance for those who found themselves out of suddenly unemployed. In the first four months of the pandemic, 146,000 children tuned into our multilingual story times and our free high quality content featured by MoMA and NBC Today. They continue to be in high demand. The demand for programming has been matched by the demand for books. Between March and June, 
e-checkouts for young adult materials increased by 80% compared to the previous year and nearly tripled for children's materials. To keep pace, we dramatically expanded our digital collection, which now contains more than 400,000 ebooks, audiobooks, videos, and subscriptions. We also pledged to ensure that our collection as a whole reflects more Black and Indigenous viewpoints. As proud as we are of meeting so many of the needs so quickly, we remain painfully aware that we are leaving behind hundreds of thousands of Brooklynites who do not have access to the internet. The pandemic has widened the digi digital divide in our city. Before March, Brooklyn Public Library was the largest provider of free internet service in the borough. And even as we closed our doors, we decided to keep the Wi-Fi on at all of our, brand, at all of our branches throughout the pandemic. With more than 1,000 people gathering outside on a single day to try and catch the signal coming through our windows and doors, we became more committed than ever to acting and advocating for more equitable access to broadband. Last month, with the support of several private funders, Brooklyn Public Library launched the Brooklyn Reach Project which will extend free unlimited Wi-Fi 300 feet from our branches via new rooftop antennas. Antennas have already been installed in neighborhoods with the highest need. Brownsville, Bushwick, Coney Island, and Fort Greene, as well as Red Hook and Flatbush, where we have been able to configure outdoor library spaces with furniture loaned from the Department of Transportation. The antennas will ultimately be installed on 44 branch rooftops across the borough, enabling more Brooklynites to submit online job applications, complete their schoolwork, check out library books, and much more. Alongside the dramatic expansion of the library's digital services and Wi-Fi signal, Brooklyn Public Library has begun to gradually reopen our branches. The safety of our patrons and staff are paramount to us, and we followed the guidelines and recommendations of leading public health authorities, as well as other urban library systems and our tri partners to develop a comprehensive multi-phased reopening plan. In June, our capital planning and facilities management team and custodial staff worked together to reconfigure workspaces and implement new cleaning, ventilation, PPE, and workspace distancing protocols. All Brooklyn Public Library locations, apart from those under construction, are now open to our staff so they can perform inventory, collections, and reference work and produce on-site virtual programming. As of this moment, 27 of our libraries, including Central, are now open to the public for grab and go lobby service. One individual or family at a time can enter the library to return and pick up books. Since reopening, we've welcomed nearly 200,000 Brooklynites back into our branches and helped patrons check out more than 120,000 books with far more on hold. We have also hosted limited outdoor programming our open air Ask a Tech sessions provide free tech assistance in multiple languages outside branches, which has been especially important as the pandemic has forced so many of us to adapt to new technologies. Our university open air offered free classes in Prospect Park. And every week in October, our Open Streets Initiative at Macon Library in Bed-Stuy offered children's programming and a small browsing collection. While closely monitoring the number of COVID cases in Brooklyn and across our city, we are preparing to open seven branches for further services, including first, first floor browsing, limited computer and printer use, and reference assistance. In those zones and elsewhere in Brooklyn, the library has partnered with, a new, with the New York City uh, Health and Hospitals Test and Trace Corps. A test and trace grant 
has allowed library staff to distribute 270,000 masks and reach more than 19,000 Brooklynites with information about essential resources, resources such as free testing sites and emergency food relief. We have begun to hold weekly virtual health fairs in order to help our patrons navigate the constantly evolving information regarding testing sites, insurance coverage, and more. The Test and Trace Corps used our Williamsburg and Borough Park libraries as PPE and information distribution sites and offered outdoor pop-up COVID testing at Pattergate and Brighton Beach libraries. And we are ready to leverage more of our branches as needed. Throughout the crises, the library has endeavored to be as a reliable partner to the city. Early in the pandemic, when PPE was scarce, we worked in partnership with Columbia University to print face shields for healthcare workers using 3D printers from our branches. We partnered with the NYC Emergency Management and mobilized staff to offer five branches to act as cooling centers over the summer. On primary day in June and election day in November, 18 of our branches served as safe polling sites for Brooklynites exercising their right to vote. In partnership with the city's anti-gun violence employment program, Brooklyn Public Library hosted a six week intensive virtual summer program for 14 to 24 year olds residing in Brooklyn, uh, specific NYCHA developments. We delivered more than 13,000 summer reading books and activity booklets for children and teens to the Department of Education, as well as schools, homeless shelters, and child care centers. We recently partnered with the Department of Corrections to provide incarcerated New Yorkers with a virtual library via tablets, and with the city's Department of Youth and Community Development to host learning labs. At six of our branches, K through eight students will be able to access remote learning and enjoy an enriching environment when they cannot be in school. As you know, the vast majority of our branches sorely need capital improvement. We are extremely grateful to the council's support on that front and hope to make progress as soon as the, these construction projects are again underway. Fortunately, we have managed to forge ahead with a few self-managed projects, including the new Greenpoint Library and Environmental Education Center, a stunning model for the libraries we are working to revitalize across Brooklyn and for 21st century libraries across the country. We also recently launched the Center for Brooklyn History at Brooklyn Public Library, which will allow all New Yorkers free and open access to the most expansive collection of Brooklyn history in the world, as well as former Brooklyn Historical Society building in Brooklyn Heights, which will soon open for grab and go library service. Despite the myriad of challenges of the pandemic, I cannot think of a timelier milestone for Brooklyn Public Library. There is a real hunger in our city and our country to better understand our past so that we might build a better future. As we build that future more equitable, more cohesive, more sustainable, libraries stand to play a vital role. After New York City was devastated by Hurricane Sandy, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development launched an initiative called Rebuild by Design to research how cities might better respond and recover from future disasters. Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist at NYU and director of the initiative, identified public libraries as a city's resiliency centers. Libraries, he writes, are essential to promoting stronger social ties and communities with stronger social ties are time and again, proven to be safer, healthier, and more resilient. The COVID-19 pandemic has meant months of unprecedented social isolation for New Yorkers, as well as economic and educational deprivation. It has laid bare and exacerbated so many of our cities and our country's inequities. Public libraries trusted by every generation in every neighborhood 
are uniquely suited to help rebuild our social and civic infrastructure and ensure that infrastructure serves all of us. At a time when we need our fellow New Yorkers to feel connected to and invested in their communities, we are grateful that this committee, the City Council and the administration recognize the essential work of libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Johnson, for your testimony. And um, I, I don't know if you were getting a little emotional at the beginning of your testimony, but I, I found some of your testimony to uh, be somewhat emotional because of uh, the moment that we are in, uh, what we've all been through and are still going through, but also the remarkable resiliency of the Brooklyn Public Library. And I know we're gonna hear uh, what I imagine to be very similar uh, stories from the other two systems. Uh, I wanna recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Joni, along with uh, Councilmember Moya, who I mentioned before, and I believe Majority Leader Cumbo has also uh, joined uh, the, the hearing. And, uh, you know, I just want to uh, make sure because I wrote down some of these these notes that um, even in the uh, heat of and council member Joe Borelli from Staten Island has joined. So every member of the committee is now uh, on on the hearing. Uh, we have 100 percent attendance from the uh, committee members. Um, but, uh, you know, at a time when people uh, uh, sort of thought libraries were closed and maybe not. Uh, uh, doing things that they could easily see. Uh, if I got your numbers right, uh, 700,000 people participated in online programs at the Brooklyn Public Library, 146,000 children uh, tuned in for uh, uh, children's programs, uh, 27 libraries open for grab and go, uh, 200,000 Brooklynites have uh, already visited uh, in person in those those libraries. Obviously, uh, you have seven more sites going, uh, uh, hopefully to uh, open soon and, and maybe even with some, some more services offered. Uh, and uh, you printed face shields uh, through 3D printers when we needed them. Uh, and uh, some testing sites, some libraries used as testing sites and PPE distribution centers, um, uh, 13,000 uh, uh, children benefited from summer reading materials and learning labs and, and uh, incarcerated virtual libraries. Um, all of that while we were in the midst of a pandemic and um, you know, that, uh, that made me emotional at various points in listening to you testify. Uh, and I hope that uh, both the members of the council and the administration, and of course the people of the city of New York, um, uh, hear all of this and understand uh, the, the breadth of activity that's going on at our public libraries, um, even if it looks like your, your neighborhood branch isn't open for public service in the way that it once was before the pandemic. So uh, I'll have more questions, but I did just want to say um, that's, uh, that's uh, an incredible amount of work um, that's going on. And obviously the staff of the Brooklyn Public Library uh, deserves so much credit for uh, doing that courageous work um, during a pandemic. Yeah, thank you, um, Councilman. I, I'm glad you mentioned the staff because um, there have been people who are just, you know, as I said, you know, working nonstop, um, hair on fire for all these months. Um, and they're doing it because um, it's painfully clear to us that the pandemic has actually made the most vulnerable among us that much more vulnerable, that much further behind, that being on the wrong side of the digital divide is that much more devastating as children aren't able to learn um, at the same rate um, with the same resources as more affluent um, children. 
and the staff has been extraordinary and um, and they're doing it because they believe so deeply in the work of the library and I'm very fortunate to be supported by such a terrific team. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And before uh, the, the council throws it over to Tony, um, you know, we also know that, that COVID has affected disproportionately uh, black and brown communities, uh, immigrant communities, um, communities with uh, uh, fewer resources and, and COVID is uh, uh, laid bare for many who weren't previously aware just how uh, disproportionately affected uh, these communities are. Uh, but while some institutions are, are, are uh, uh, playing uh, catch up, um, you know, and, and all institutions could do better, I feel like libraries have uh, been there to provide some of these uh, services to folks uh, who don't have a lot of money, uh, who may be undocumented, um, uh, long before others um, discovered in this moment that there were incredible disparities uh, in, in our society. But uh, libraries have, uh, have largely always been there. We could always do more, we could always do better, but libraries, um, have been there. Uh, so with that, um, Council, do you want to call on President Marx or, or is it suffice to say I'm calling on President Marx to deliver his testimony? Chair, it's suffice to say. You can also call us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and the members of the committee for your support of libraries uh, in the past and, uh, and today. Um, so obviously, first things first, uh, the pandemic means we have prioritized health and safety of our staff and patrons. That's just, you know, absolutely number one. We'll come back to that. Uh, in spite of the closures that we've had to uh, in all endure uh, during these times, these physical closures, we have clearly, as you've heard in Brooklyn as well, of course, maintained our commitment to provide the public with equitable and accessible services. A lot of that is now virtual. Um, so we saw 45,000 new library cards sign up through our Simply E app. We've had 2.1 million digital checkouts uh, since closure. 65,000 new users just of our own app for eBooks, Simply E. Uh, database item requests close to a million. 25,000 holds. Um, it's just been extraordinary to see uh, my colleagues um, really you know, remove all the constraints uh, and offer everything that we can uh, digitally. That includes wellness, housing, food security information, educational programs, for instance, Tech Connect continues to teach coding, website development, Microsoft Office. People try to bring their businesses back or try to create businesses. We've got career services that include online job training, one-on-one -on -one coaching for interviews, templates for resumes. We've supported distance learning for parents, caregivers, students, and educators, of course. Um, so for instance, the summer, this summer we distributed 40,000 uh, book kits uh, as part of the summer reading. Research library, scan and deliver. You can request any document and we'll send it to you. Uh, as well as having negotiated but not yet launched publicly what will be um, an, a research ebook collection available to anyone in the world that will uh, be the largest ebook collection ever, something in the area of three to four million volumes. Uh, and that has already begun to be used. In the meantime, a uh, massive increase of our data, of, of databases. Uh, as I said, close to a million data-based requests. Um, we've had, uh, we've used the research library as well to pump out what people are so eager for. So for instance, when uh, the George Floyd um, horror and everything that that has brought to the surface that we all have known was there, but has been brought to the surface, we, working with the Schomburg, uh, launched the Black Liberation Reading List. We've done more of those around voting, around all the issues that everyone has been confronting. Um, and it's just been, uh, just been remarkable. We know, of course, 
that too many New Yorkers are on the wrong side of the digital divide. And I just want to add, uh, you know, I've said this too many times, and I just want to add to what Linda said. It's, you know, may, you know, when we can pump out bleed from our, um, from our branches to help some people get connected, when we can do hotspot, that's great. It's great. But I'm sorry, this is 2020. The, very, the fact that we live in the information capital, the financial capital of the world, and millions of New Yorkers simply can't go to school now, do their schoolwork, do their jobs, apply for jobs, because we don't believe that's a minimum basic utility we owe the citizens. So, uh, sorry, just sidebar, listening to Linda. Yeah, we can have this testimony. We can talk about whatever we want. But, you know, we have to solve this problem. It is, this is a fundamental failing of this city at this point to, ba to provide the basic services that we need the city to provide for us to be able to do the work that we need to do. That could not be more clear now. Sorry. No, don't apologize. I think it's so. Uh, but we know because of that, the physical work that we do is all the more important. Um, so we moved to phase one with the grab and go. We're over 50 locations. Um, we, to, just to bring you up to date, last Monday we moved um, the research library and 14 locations to what we called phase two, which was adding um, browsing and computer use. That actually was going smoothly. We had worked for months for that. Um, by the middle of the week, it became, uh, or towards the end of the week, it became obvious that uh, the numbers in Staten Island were going very much in the wrong direction. We closed the three, we moved the three phase twos in Staten Island back to phase one, so we didn't stop, grab, and go. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we concluded um, that the numbers were consistently going in the wrong direction and decided to move uh, all of our phase two services after only a week back to phase one for now while we continue to track the caseload. Again, playing it safe, um, very frustrating for all involved. Um, we've proved we can do phase two, we're ready to do it again. We're waiting for the numbers to give us the confidence that we can do that. But whatever level of physical services we provide, we are absolutely doing everything we can to ensure the health and safety uh, of our patrons and staff. All Tony, can I, Tony, can I just interrupt one second? Uh, just because you mentioned, and I don't want to lose this uh, point. Uh, do you have a, a, a level uh, of positivity uh, a number in mind in terms of what would allow you to continue with phase two? Is that something that is... We are, is so we are uh, we we use lots of different metrics. We obviously have been taking a close look at what has been condensed into the yellow, uh, orange, and red uh, notifications. The uh, yellow uh, is what draw drew you know focused our attention, if you will, uh, in the Staten Island situation, and as we saw other areas, particularly in the Bronx, moving in the same direction. Um, we we've said we won't use a single metric. Um, we, uh, you know, we have lots of experts on this. AirTech, we will talk to everybody. Uh, my, print, my view is we should have the expert advice and we should always be what I call a half a step more conservative than the expert advice. Um, that the, that if, I make, if we make a mistake on the, air, on the side of erring on safety, I'll live with that. Um, we'll, we'll live with that. Okay. Anyway, the, um, but we are doing everything to make sure that everyone is safe. We've had no instances of transmission uh, into or, 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 you know, among the library or from the library. Um, we, um, we know obviously that the ultimate goal is to have all of our libraries back fully up and functioning. Uh, the reason, as we chose the facilities uh, more than half to start with uh, in terms of grab and go. Of course, we looked at ADA accessibility, proximity to other libraries, staff availability, where we're making accommodations, for instance, for staff who have kids uh, that, that are at home and not in school, uh, ability to implement safety protocols, 
construction as well as offering our branches for testing and other public needs, learning labs, et cetera. Um, apologies. On the capital front, uh, the crisis resulted in the halt on all capital projects in March, um, including 62 active capital projects. Since then, 16, one six of those projects have been restarted. We continue to work with the city's Office of Management and Budget, as well as DDC. Um, we look forward to having all these projects, particularly our Carnegie restorations back on, uh, back on track just as soon as we can. Um, look, it's been an amazingly difficult and challenging year. The libraries, our colleagues have really, you know, stepped up to the plate. Um, we, you know, we were the most used physical facilities, civic facilities in this city. We are now the front and center uh, for what we can do physically and certainly what is happening virtually in terms of helping with learning, helping with information access in these times, uh, as, uh, as Linda's already eloquently said, as Chairman, you've already said, nothing could be more important to ensure opportunity to ensure regrowth, to ensure re-envisioning of where we will go, where we can and must go uh, after, uh, after we get through these, uh, these difficult days. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Tony. Um, you, uh, uh, I don't know if you have this handy or someone on your team does. Uh, Linda had mentioned that 200,000 Brooklynites had visited in person uh, to the 27 locations that were open for grab and go. Do you have that number for the near public library, the 50 locations where you have grab and go during COVID? I do not have it right in front of me. Uh, I will get it to you if I don't get it, have it before the end of this session, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I mean, that would that would be helpful, I, I think, because, uh, you know, it's also incredibly important that you just reported that there have been, you know, zero transmissions uh, of the virus uh, amongst the staff and 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 customers uh, while you had that service at 50 locations. Um, and uh, obviously, you've demonstrated that you can provide the services. Um, and, and do that uh, with a level of caution that keeps everyone safe. Uh, so uh, uh, I would love to, uh, to know that number of how many folks have actually visited uh, the NYPL in person, um, which just, I think, further amplifies the, uh, the safety measures that you're taking, uh, particularly as you move to phase uh, two uh, and, uh, and I think uh, all three systems looking at maybe different versions of phase two, but some versions of phase two that include a bit more uh, browsing, computer use, and, and uh, in, in library uh, time, shall we say. Uh, so hopefully you can get that before we're, we're done with questions, but I would uh, now ask uh, Dennis Walcott, President and CEO of the Queens Public Library, to testify. You have to unmute yourself, Dennis. Hi again. There we go. Yep, no, we go. I'm here. So first, good morning to you, Chair, and to all the members of the council, to the speaker, and let me thank you for all of your support, uh, not just this year, but over the years. And just to give you that number from the beginning, it's 278,000 people who have come through our doors for a variety of different services. And I'll go into more detail in a little while, but- uh, Thank you both with Linda and Tony, I think they capture the true passion of what we've been doing throughout three systems. And one word I wanna add before I give my formal testimony is the word nimble. I mean, I think all of us, and thanks to our great staff, have been extremely nimble in adapting to the environment, adapting to the programs, uh, really gearing up and providing the protective services uh, that we need for both our staff and to the public. And I want to say a real big thank you to all of our teams in all three systems because they have been on the front line. And recently at an all staff gathering, 
uh, virtually. I uh, complimented, I think, the unsung heroes who are part of the teams, because a lot of times you see the people who are in the public, but our custodians have done an outstanding job, and they are the ones who are going constantly to the libraries to make sure they're clean, making sure uh, they're ready for the public, and sometimes I don't necessarily give them enough praise. So I want to publicly thank our custodians and support staff for all the work that we're doing. Right now, I'm at Central, uh, and we you know, have Central serving as a grab-and-go site that started yesterday. And we opened Flushing as a grab-and-go site as well starting yesterday. And our book preparers are there, and everything is just going on. It's just, unfortunately, we can't have the constant flow. So now I'd like to flow into the testimony. And as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every citizen, business, and government in the world. It has changed the way we interact with one another and has forced us to reconsider all the things that we take for granted as normal. Uh, I, along with my colleagues, had to make the very difficult decision to close our locations and shut our doors back a long time ago now, March 16th, 2020, to serve the greater good and try to mitigate the spread of this disease. It was a difficult decision because I know that hundreds of thousands of people rely on our collections and free programs and services on a daily basis. However, it was a decision that had to be made in order to save lives. As the city began to shut down with schools closing and all non-essential businesses shuttering, we at the Queens Public Library knew that we had to rapidly alter our service delivery mechanisms in order to serve a public now confined to their homes and unable to visit our physical locations. Our world-class staff swiftly adapted our in-person programming to fit the virtual world. Uh, within the first two weeks of our closure, QPL established an online calendar offering a range of virtual activities, including our instantly popular children's story times, Zumba, and a session with Ralph McDaniels as well, our hip hop expert. In addition to that, we have Facebook Live, Ask the Census Bureau sessions, and established all the other types of programs we were doing over a period of time. Over time, our virtual offerings became even more diverse and expansive and allowed our staff to try new and innovative initiatives such as QPL at night, a virtual nightlife hotspot for entertainment, civic engagement and learning geared towards a millennial audience. In August, as part of our work towards racial equity, I had a panel discussion to be black in America, a conversation with races about racism with Attorney General Letitia James and Dr. Wayne Riley, president of SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. Uh, this vital and necessary conversation addressed racial disparities in regards to COVID-19, but also in the daily lives of black and brown people living in this country. Uh, we partnered with BrainFuse, one of the nation's leading online tutoring providers, uh, to provide access to free homework help, including live online tutoring and test prep in a wide range of subjects for K through 12 students and adult learners. From April through October, QPL hosted over 5,700 programs uh, that were attended by over 100,000 customers. Since our closure, our adult learning program uh, hosted over 100 virtual courses serving 1,800 while 700 individuals registered for the New Americans programs ESOL 2020 virtual fall semester. With everyone at home, the library swiftly 25,000 ebooks, e magazines, audiobooks, and videos to our digital platform. Within the first six weeks of our closure, ebooks and e magazines had a circulation increase of over 104%. As we move to a more virtual world, however, it laid bare the disparities that had been talked about earlier in regards to the broadband connectivity in the local communities we serve. In certain areas, such as in Southeast Queens, approximately 43% of the households are without broadband access. Access QPL uh, serves as a critical lifeline for individuals who do not have these services and technology uh, in their homes. Our customers rely on our free Wi-Fi services for a plethora of reasons, such as to stay connected with families and friends, to pay bills as well, and to make sure that they attend school remotely and satisfy other educational needs. But as Tony and Linda have both pointed out, that's still not acceptable as far as the need out there in the public as well. Uh, in an effort to increase our digital access, QPL 
has extended our Wi-Fi available to, at 20 of our locations, allowing anyone, whether they have a library card or not, to access our broadband service using their personal device up to 150 yards from our buildings. The extended Wi-Fi is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the public is taking full advantage of it. During the first quarter of this fiscal year, we recorded nearly 118,000 Wi-Fi sessions. Last week, QPL launched our newly redesigned mobile app with an improved user-friendly interface, allowing customers to navigate with ease. Features include the ability to search, for, search or scan books, find nearby locations, and read, watch, and listen to content directly from the app. As all of us have confronted the COVID-19 pandemic and the manifestations of racial injustice across the country, and here at home, New York City endured unprecedented heartache, economic hardship, and turmoil. In developing our reopening plans, there was one thing we all knew, the world would now need and demand more from libraries than ever before. This understanding strengthened our to meet our mission, delivering critical, critical services and resources remotely and offering everyone, no matter who they are or where they come from, the chance to achieve their full potential. After thoughtfully and carefully formulating a plan for our location's eventual reopening, QPL set that plan into motion with our first branches reopening on July 13th. We reopened seven libraries for to-go service and returns six days a week and nine locations at fulfillment centers accepting returns 24 hours a day, seven days a week. From the outset, the health and safety of the public and our staff have been paramount. We established new protocols based on the latest public health guidance. Before a library is reopened, the building undergoes extensive disinfecting and cleaning, and our spaces are reconfigured to promote social distancing and support new service models. All return materials are quarantined in compliance with the national standards before they are put back into circulations. A circulation, we require all staff and customers to wear masks. We provide masks to people who do not have them. We provide all Queens Public Library staff with masks, hand sanitizer, and other personal protective equipment, as well as making hand sanitizer available to the public at all open branches. We held virtual training for staff on how to stay safe and provided counseling and support services to promote good mental health. I care deeply about the safety and health, like all of our colleagues do, of everyone here at QPL, and ensured that we had the measures in place to face new challenges posed by the COVID-19 world. On August 10th, we opened eight additional libraries for to-go services. And on September 28th, we opened eight more and extended our, our fines and fees exemption on all materials through January, 2021. Yesterday, on November 16th, we opened our two largest libraries, Central and Flushing, bringing locations reopened since July uh, to 25. And currently two previously open branches are closed, Sunnyside, which is undergoing capital renovations for ADA compliance, and Kew Gardens Hills, which is an H plus H COVID test site. On November 30th, barring any unforeseen circumstances, we will open an additional 12 more branches as well. While we have been planning to begin offering public computer appointments next week in light of the rising number of COVID-19 cases in and around the cities, we will delay the computer services until an appropriate time. As Tony indicated, we'll use a variety of measures to determine when we're ready to do that. And we're continually monitoring and assessing internal and external factors and remain nimble and responsive to the evolving public health situation. While undergoing the arduous task of safely reopening, we have remained engaged with the city and continue our excellent partnership with the administration. We have always been there for the city and as, need, as it has needed us. And as stated earlier, we knew we would be needed now more than ever. Operating under the stress of the pandemic, we successfully conducted early voting at our Jackson Heights location in June and November operated 13 other polling locations on primary and election day and served as cooling centers for the public and have had five of our locations serving as COVID-19 testing sites where we've had over 10,000 people come through our library doors uh, for testing as well. Uh, as you know, with our partners at Brooklyn and New York, we've also done a lot of outreach around census work as well and had our census teams working in conjunction uh, with the city uh, to make sure that here in Queens, we contributed to a two percentage 
point increase in our borough of self-response and when compared to the 2010 census. We always stand ready to serve the public and will continue to do so for as long as we have the capacity and resources. Libraries are trusted entities and we're also working with the city in developing learning labs as well, uh, which people turn to on a regular basis and we strive towards making sure we continue to be vibrant and form cohesive and working with our staff as well as our public uh, to make sure we provide the necessary supports and services and information to make sure people are well informed. And with that, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you, the members of the council, and also through our Tri-Li partnership, which I can't thank enough for the teamwork that we do, both with Linda, Tony, and I talking on a regular basis, our teams at various levels talking, and having weekly meetings of Tri-Li and working sure, making sure that we are coordinated in our response. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dennis. And uh, of course, I, I know all of this as the chair of the committee, but I think it bears repeating uh, for uh, all of those uh, who, are, who are watching and, and who may see some form of this, um, that the libraries played a key role in uh, the census drive here in uh, the city of New York, and it could not have uh, reached the level of success that it did without our public libraries uh, being crucial partners in that effort. Uh, the fact that you were also polling sites, cooling centers, and uh, COVID testing sites uh, at the same time that you were uh, reopening libraries for uh, a form of public service is, uh, is incredible. And I think demonstrates to the world uh, just how indispensable uh, libraries are. And, and I hope that everyone remembers uh, what you have done, what you are doing and what you will continue uh, doing uh, as we go through uh, further phases of this pandemic uh, and hopefully towards an end to it uh, when we do talk about uh, the uh, budget uh, issues uh, of the city of New York as it relates to public libraries. Um, that uh, we need you now more than ever. You have come through for the city of New York more than ever and in our literally uh, saving lives. Um, Dennis uh, knows this uh, uh, because we talk and, you know, I get tested every uh, three or so weeks because I interact with so many members of the public and I am a, a caretaker of my nearly 81 year old mother. Uh, and so I have used uh, the Far Rockaway, Kew Gardens Hills and Lefferts uh, libraries as rapid testing sites and uh, it is uh, brilliant to see uh, our public libraries uh, used, uh, in that way. And, uh, um, and while it's a very different experience going through the library and not seeing what we would normally see, uh, I know I'm grateful and certainly uh, uh, they're being used. A lot of people are going through those libraries as testing centers. Uh, and just to go back, um, uh, Linda had 200,000 in-person visits. You had almost 300,000 in-person visits. You know, uh, near a public library has has more uh, locations, uh, and so I'm going to guess that their number is is uh, a, a robust number. Um, and uh, uh, Tony, if you have that number, feel free to interject. If not, I'm just going to say that you're probably Close, you can, you can unmute yourself. And With the number we had as of uh, until through September was 200,000. We don't have the October number yet. So my guess is it'll be in the 230-ish thousand. We'll get right. to you. Yeah, so I mean, if, if, uh, if, if in the middle of this pandemic, we've had, you know, 700, 750,000 people in-person visit a public library, uh, you know, it, it just talks about how desperate people are for 
the information uh, and and for that that connectivity to a place that they trust so much. Um, and the fact that you've been able to do it safely. Uh, 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 Tony mentioned that that there's been no uh, uh, transmission at the NYPL. Uh, uh, I'm hoping that Queens Public Library and Brooklyn Public Library have had similar uh, uh, experiences with safety in terms of staff and public. So at Queens, we had a, um, a security guard who had a family member who tested. So we put our protocol in place and then moved the folks out of that while we did a deep cleaning, but we haven't had any positive cases of our staff directly. Um, and but again, I think part of what we've been able to do, and I think this is part that council member, you definitely would know, what we've set up is uh, basic pods of staff where we have various teams of staff in place. So if someone should test positive, then we'll move that entire team out, shut down the library, do the cleaning, but then have a second team come in place which has provided, I think, a very more complex, but a more safe uh, system of staffing and dealing with how we staff our libraries now. So, uh, but we've been lucky in that regard as well. Linda, you're on mute, Linda. Uh, can I just say, while Linda's unmuting, that, that we had no transmissions we have had seven staff members come uh, test positive for cases, and we've used exactly the same protocols that Dennis described to ensure that there would be no transmissions, quarantine, separate shifts, et cetera. In Brooklyn, um, I'm sorry about the muting problem. There's always someone who does that. I hate that it was me this time. Um, but in Brooklyn, we, uh, we've had one maintainer who was diagnosed with COVID, and he worked at the Central Library. Um, and we immediately put the protocols in place, which meant shutting that library down. Uh, and uh, for 96 hours from the date of, um, uh, of the um, test and, uh, and making sure that anybody had close contact with was advised and, that, uh, and, and quarantined. Um, we also have uh, implemented a system like Queens, which is to have teams of, uh, of workers at a, in every um, location. So team A and team B, if there's somebody who gets sick in team A, it, it doesn't bring the whole operation to a halt. Um, once the libraries or the branches cleaned, uh, team B can come in um, and continue to, to run things there. And, and I'm uh, uh, going to assume, and uh, all three of you feel free to uh, comment, that you're working closely with uh, the staff and the, the local uh, union folks uh, and everyone is, is collaborating very closely on, uh, on all of this, particularly as, as uh, uh, I hope you will be able to do soon and that is to expand uh, uh, to phase two uh, as, as your various iterations of phase two um, look a little bit different, but, but you know, there are variations of it. So a couple of things in regards to the working with the union. Uh, yeah, we, we're really closely aligned with the union and we talk on a regular basis. Uh, they'll give us a call. We give them a call. Uh, my chief operating officer and Jonathan Slip are on, in constant communication. When necessary, John and I will talk as well. And so there's definitely a partnership. And anytime we're thinking of doing something that uh, is the next phase, we make sure we have communication with them. And even though you know this, and I don't want to make an assumption because I think, as you know, council member, just for the record, that we lost a staff member prior to the reopening. Um, and that was not necessarily through a library contact. And then my folks reminded me we also had one staff member who tested positive, but then that was uh, a while ago as well. So we're balancing that, but other than that, we haven't had any uh, other indications. So I just wanted to uh, clarify that point. Tony, Linda, anything to add? Yeah, or? For one second, just yes. to add something before you move on to your next phase of the discussion. At Lefferts, where you most recently went, because I wanted you to talk about that too, I don't want to violate your HIPAA uh, yeah. role, uh, was that uh, since it opened six days ago, Lefferts has had 629 people come to its doors to be tested. 
And wow. that's incredible. In two week period of time, Ozone Park had 2,711 people uh, to be tested. And what's different with Windsor Park, Windsor Park is solely the regular test site. Whereas Kew Gardens Hills, Ozone Park and Lefferts have been both regular tests as well as the rapid tests and having the support services there through contact tracing if anyone uh, should test positive in the rapid test and then there's an immediate social worker there and other supports. So it's really taking a look at how uh, we can partner as all of us have indicated with the city, whether through learning labs and others to not just do what we normally do, but to make sure that we're located in communities that have high impact issues that have to be addressed as well. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that, um, uh, Dennis, and uh, you also allow me to correct the record because uh, I used Ozone Park uh, once uh, not far Rockaway. Uh, and uh, that's good to hear about Lefferts because I feel like I was uh, maybe the first one to, uh, to go through there as it was, I think, the first day that they were open. I went uh, right at the beginning and uh, oh, yeah. able to essentially walk right in um, before folks uh, started to... Uh, to line up, which was uh, uh, great to see so many people using the service. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, the budget um, and, and, and COVID and, and the staffing, um, you know, how are we doing? Um, you know, there were, there were some uh, uh, reductions uh, as a result of the budget. Obviously I uh, didn't support those but, uh, but uh, it could have been uh, a lot worse, uh, as we all know. But uh, what, what impact, if any, have you felt? Um, and, and how are you experiencing staffing? Because obviously we know a lot of people have uh, left the city. There, there are people moving. There's just a lot of uh, people transitioning in and out. Obviously, if you have a, a, a stable job, you're less likely probably to... Uh, to move out of the city, but I'm just wondering about all of that, just because these are such uh, difficult times and a lot of people uh, have uh, decided uh, either they want to try something different in life or they need to get out of the city for various reasons. Um, what has been your experience? But, but talk a little bit about the budget and uh, uh, because obviously we are uh, looking at a very severe situation in the city, uh, uh, budget modification that uh, we are looking at. And um, uh, one day we hope for a, a federal relief package, but, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we can't uh, go to the bank with, with that just yet, nor do we know what libraries uh, would get it as a result of that. So um, maybe the three of you can talk a little bit about those things. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the lead. Uh, you know, our, our workforce has been stable, actually. Um, we have not seen a lot of uh, attrition or, or resignations. Um, we have also been um, very uh, open and straightforward with our people. Um, if they have concerns, health concerns, or if there are reasons um, that they can't be reporting to their branches um, as we started to reopen, um, we're, we're having everybody operate on the honor code. And, and because we're not at a full complement yet, um, we've been able to manage. Um, of course, with the opening of each additional branch, um, we have less and less leeway. And, um, and because we have um, more limited hours, um, we're also sort of in a position right now where we're not stressed in terms of staffing. Um, and, and there's Really, when I'm, when I am around and talking to people who are working in the branches, uh, the concerns are uh, as much about the commute um, as about being in the library. I think it's actually more about the commute than actually being at work. Um, I find that staff is actually eager to be um, back at work and and being productive and helping um, and doing the work that they love to do. Um, I, I think um, as the weather continues to get colder and there's less we can do outdoors, that will also um, pose some challenges. Uh, but our priority, um, you know, as I said at the outset, at outset, is to keep everybody safe and healthy. That's our staff as well as our patrons. Um, and I think we've demonstrated that priority to our people and that's um, led to 
um, an environment where um, on that front we're, we're, we're trusted, which is great. Um, in terms of the budget, um, you know, right now we are managing because we are not at full complement of open libraries. Um, we are very concerned um, about the future um, and when we are able to resume full operation and um, I'm worried that we won't have the resources to maintain the schedules that we've been able to put in place thanks so much to the city and council support uh, in recent years. Yeah, just to pick up on Linda's point, it's basically the same with QPL. I, I think that uh, we've been able to manage fairly well. Obviously, uh, a lot of expense went in in the beginning around the purchasing of the PPE equipment and outfitting the libraries to make them safe for both the public and staff. So there was a lot of initial cash outlay uh, in that particular area and also the utilization of city council money to help with uh, increasing our ebook and e-material purchasing as well to make sure we had available stock available for the public to take advantage of. Uh, we've noticed some retirements. Um, I'm not sure if they're trending any higher than normal, um, but again, uh, I think as Linda articulated that, you know, with the number of buildings that we have open and serving the public and some of the staffing models we've been able to put in place, we've been able to balance both the budget and maintaining our staff. And again, in partnership with the union, uh, we've been able to identify particular needs and trying to respond to that uh, as far as what needs they may have identified that we need to address as well. So that from a staffing point of view has allowed us to have, I think the richness and diversity of the offerings that we've been able to make for the public and also the staffing models we've put in place as well. Uh, but again, uh, with the staff that are operating from home, they will rotate in as well. Uh, we've assigned computers to all of them with a VPN uh, availability to make sure they're able to connect with the library. And so we've been able to do that, I think, balancing act in a way that allows us to uh, continue the services and expand the services. I mean, I'm chomping at the bit for us to go to that next level. And as Tony indicated with his frustration, and he sent us a text on his frustration when he had to move back from the browsing, but we're looking for that next phase. We wanna to continue to increase our services to the public, both through uh, computer services, some ideas we have around printing services and making sure that the public is able to take full advantage of the buildings that we have. I mean, uh, so I, in addition to what uh, Dennis and Linda have already said, I mean, look, I think the, the basic facts of this are call, we, we, we have a reduced budget uh, we hit, got some cuts from the city. We also, we rely more than our peers on other private sources. So all those uh, endowment returns, et cetera, that all gets hit at the same time. We have increased costs. So pandemic related costs, all the security, safety, you know, PPE uh, facilities work. We, um, we also have uh, staff who we have to accommodate because they simply can't get to work. For instance, if they uh, have caretaking situations that make that impossible. We were, you know, at the same time we were disciplined. We we cut uh, ninety five positions. Um, we uh, we looked for other savings uh, across the board and found them. Uh, that means that sort of at the and by the way, I should say we are investing more in digital than we were before the pandemic. And we think that's appropriate and necessary. We haven't reduced our education expenditures. We just shifted them to virtual. Um, we think that's appropriate under these circumstances. If you put that whole package to, and, and we, we haven't had the mass layoffs we all feared. We had, I think we had five positions, full-time positions that we had to stop simply because the work couldn't happen, but we did furlough uh, in most cases, but you know, we, we didn't continue over 400 part-timers and that really hurt. That the, basically we're at this sort of serving the public as much as we can physically, being safe, massively increased virtual, right? It increased costs. Basically we're able to hold that for now, right? But, you know, if there are further, if there, if, Big cuts come or further cuts come, we're not going to be able to hold all that. It just, you know, there's a, 
it's a physics problem <laughs> in the end. And you know, that it's just, you know, if, if, if more goes, we won't be able to continue at this pace. But I think it's incredible what's been done across the five boroughs uh, under these circumstances. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tony raises a good point, which, um, which I should have mentioned as well, which is that we've reprioritized and therefore shifted oh. spending, um, especially with respect to digital collections and virtual programming, um, all of which, of course, is a way to continue to serve our patrons as best we can. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, Majority Leader Cumbo and uh, 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 I think Council Member Joe and I are still uh, with us on the hearing. And if either uh, of them have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, uh, chime in or uh, raise your hand in the Zoom. Um, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, keep uh, going. If you would like to to join in the questioning of the three presidents and the CEOs. And I do see Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, I'll ask her to say uh, a few words. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, and thank you all for the incredible work that you're doing in keeping the city going. Um, I have a, a completely self-serving question. And <laughs> Linda, you know this is coming right to you. Um, <laughs> how's, my, how's my Whitman Library coming? Um, you know, all of the DDC projects are on hold right now. Um, we're, we're looking forward to getting things moving again um, and we're working on it. Um, you know, and I, um, I have to say that our finance team led by Karen Sheehan um, has really been dogged about um, uh, uh, getting to the right people and, and, and pressing. We, we, may be, <laughs> we may be seen as pests, but um, certainly uh, worth being annoying to get these projects back online. The only projects that are currently um, uh, underway uh, are some of our self-funded projects. Um, and um, I have a couple that, if you give me one second, um, uh, that we've been able to continue. Um, because of the state of play that the projects were in when we had to, um, when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and while you're looking as well, there's another one that I just want to throw in there, sure. just, in, just in terms of the, um, the BAM South project. Yep. Because I know that there was a lot of construction that was beginning and then ending and beginning and ending or stopping and starting again. Yeah, that one um, has been restarted just recently. Okay, all yeah. right, that's news. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, we were under a lot of pressure on that project because there was uh, a lot of state money in that project which needed to be spent by a certain date. Um, and the silver lining, and there are a few of them, um, to the pandemic was that the date was extended. <laughs> so it looks like we're, uh, we're gonna be fine there. Um, there are, um, uh, we're, we're in the process actually at Walt Whitman of selecting an architect. Okay. Good to know. And, ju and just out of this, and uh, Chair Van Bramer may have covered this, this may have been brought up. I'm always curious to find out what and what practices as a result of the pandemic do you find that you would maintain and keep um, into the future? So what's been working well and this is to all of the heads of the different libraries, what has been working well that you feel um, post COVID, God willing, that you would wanna maintain and keep into the future? Um, I'll speak, so I, I think the, the most obvious is the massive expansion and uptick in use of everything digital from yeah. eBooks to yeah. pro programs, education programs, author talks, we can, we want to go back to all the physical, right? And, you know, but we don't want to lose the progress we've made here. And, and we're also very aware, um, majority leader that, you know, they're very different of, of constituencies, right? I mean, the, the, the truth is the folks in poor neighborhoods are using eBooks at a lower rate than they are in the richer neighborhoods. So mm. it's great that we're able to meet some needs with eBooks, but we clearly need to do better at reaching out and getting you know, the students in the poor neighborhoods to understand this resource, to be excited about this resource, 
to, for them to feel that it's meeting their needs and them wanting to use it. So we've, we've, we need to invest, continue that investment. We also need to be assessing where it's, where it's working, where the demand is. And if we see that it's not working in the areas that of the most need, that's what the library specialize in. That's what we double down in. Right. I just want to add to that. I think the virtual world is definitely something that we'll be keeping. I think what the virtual world allows us to do is to reach different type of people to be a part of the information sharing where they don't have to travel to a particular site. We set up the link for people to then connect and reaching out. I think as Tony has said several times, and Linda's also said, I mean, I think the disparity of those who are able to take advantage of that based on the lack of connectivity is something that we have to address. And I think that spurs us on to continue the expansion of our Wi-Fi capability, our extended networks, and the ways we try to make sure we provide broadband access to the entire public. Uh, the other thing that I think is extremely exciting is the ability to be creative with uh, programming. I mean, both by force of need, uh, the partner- Time expired. The, city point, but the, the uh, relationship with the city has increased in so many different ways. So are there multiple things we can use our buildings for at the same time maintaining library services as well? And exploring those options, I think is something that excites me because we've been able to produce as a result of that partnership with the city and making sure we increase different types of services as well. So that's another way of approaching, I think, building on, unfortunately, what we've had to face over the last nine to 10 months to hopefully where we will be going in the future as far as more in-person type of services. Yeah, um, I'd like to just add, which, um, there are many things that have improved in the way we operate and we don't want to lose them. Um, for example, attendance is way up at a lot of our programs because we're not constrained by um, physical space. So for example, we have an annual uh, lit film festival. Uh, we have an auditorium that seats 200 people. And so that's the limit um, in terms, or in the past, that was the limit in terms of how many people could attend a film given night. Um, this year, of course, we showed the film, uh, you know, via Zoom, and uh, we had like almost 500 people each night watching these films. And so um, what we need to do is to be um, taking the lessons learned from this time and, and figuring out how we can be both, uh, you know, sort of operating in parallel worlds so that we can be both present when people want to do that, but also take advantage of what virtual reach um, has allowed us to do. The other thing that's interesting is the way we're working. Um, and so now that everybody is set up to work remotely, um, there's some real efficiencies there. And, um, and we need to make sure that we don't let those advantages um, slide once we're, um, we're, we're back uh, in, our, uh, in our regular world, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Majority Leader Kumbo. Um, and uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand. Uh, Dennis, you mentioned uh, uh, 12 more uh, libraries to open. Um, could you just tell us uh, again when that would be ideally? Obviously, uh, uh, anything can happen. Obviously, we hope bad things don't uh, relative to COVID, but when that uh, is planned and which libraries would be part of that expansion of service in Queens? Sure, by uh, November 30th uh, is when we'll be opening. And I know Nick is there and Nick and Sun can give you the specifics, but just so you will know, one of them includes Hunter's Point as well. So Hunter's Point will open as a uh, grab and go site by the end of this month. And so that's happening. And then just again, in your particular area council member uh, chair, um, as you know, we opened up uh, Sunnyside and then we closed it down because we had the money and approval from OMB to do the ADA work and building a ramp outside and Woodside will be going through some interior renovation as well, then we'll be reopening that. So while Linda also indicated that you know, a lot of our projects are on hold right now, we've had certain projects where we've gotten a little bit of money and flexibility to continue. So Steinway, uh, is in process. 
uh, Far Rock is in process as far as capital work is concerned and Glendale, we're wrapping that up and that'll be in the beginning, well, the first quarter, maybe the second quarter of 2021. Right. And just to, while, well, uh, if, if, if uh, Nick or Sung want to join in, uh, they can, uh, they'll identify themselves first and then give the answer uh, to the rest of the libraries. But Long Island City is uh, still open. Oh yeah, very much so. Uh, and, uh, and has been one of the first. And, and Broadway uh, in Astoria, is that open? No, right. Astoria, I think, is slated to open, and again, I can stand corrected on that. I'm not sure about Broadway, so I would defer to the experts who know that better than I do. Hello, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, Nick Buron, uh, Chief Librarian, uh, Queens Public Library. Uh, Astoria is open, um, as well as you correct the city, and Dennis gave away the punchline on Hunter's Point, which is great. Um, just to, for the record, the other libraries that will be opening um, will be good. East Flushing, Elmhurst, Glen Oaks, Hollis, Hunters Point was mentioned, Left Rack City, Massbeth, Mitchell, Richmond Hill, Rochdale Village and St. Albans. And once Sunnyside reopens and Kew Garden Hills reopens as a library as well, that will bring us to seven locations open to the public for to-go service. Thank you. Terrific. What is the timeline on the on the ADA work at Sunnyside? So that work uh, has begun. Uh, our understanding is about six to eight weeks. So we hope that um, by you know no later than January we'll be able to get the site back. Uh, there isn't much work going on inside, so we feel pretty confident that as soon as we get the turnover, that we'll be able to uh, reopen to to go service. Great. Uh, thank you uh, for that. And, uh, you know, just to uh, finish up, uh, you know, uh, Tony talked a little bit about this, that uh, given the uh, budget reduction uh, that you did take and given the additional expenses that you've incurred and obviously the incredible challenges that no one could have anticipated, all of us going through, uh, you are doing a remarkable amount for the city of New York uh, and really stretched uh, thin in terms of resources. Uh, it's not like anyone is swimming in uh, extra resources uh, at this point. And, and uh, with a budget modification, um, uh, you know, uh, staring us down and, uh, and obviously, you know, we will uh, uh, have another budget uh, completed uh, uh, while we are still uh, confronting uh, COVID. Uh, we hope it's the last. Um, you know, you've been able to avoid uh, layoffs uh, at this point, but if you were to receive uh, substantial reductions uh, uh, going forward, uh, you would you would uh, be really hurt, uh, and uh, your ability to uh, stave off layoffs could be compromised. And so, you know, uh, maybe just uh, talk a little bit about you know what's what you're confronted with and what you hope happens, uh, and and what you what you can't afford to happen. Um. You know, our budget is largely um, made up of wages uh, for the people who work in our libraries, uh, and and cuts uh, and cuts translate to hours of service. Um, the other the other significant uh, portion of our budget is the collection, and so uh, you know, a, a first step would of course be to go to the collection budget to avoid having to reduce hours, um, but that just goes so far. And so uh, the devastating thing about layoffs is of course um, that uh, they happen in times when people are suffering and um, not only our patrons, but um, our staff and to cut back hours um, when you're serving such a vital role in the community and when people need you to be opened and need a place to come and to, um, and to interact with their 
uh, with their neighbors as much as with the staff um, is really devastating. I think this all sort of came home to us um, in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing when the um, when the plaza of the Central Library became the gathering point, both before some of the protests as well as after some of the marches. Um, and it became clear that this language that we've long used about the library as the town hall uh, or the town square is really true. Um, and that people do in fact need to come together um, and that the libraries are perfectly situated to um, provide that function. It's what we've always done. It's what it's it's an important part of who we are, and every um, and every hour that we can't be opened is an hour that we can't provide that um, service. Not only on the literacy, education, civic engagement, all of those important programs, but just um, in terms of what we do for a neighborhood and providing that uh, that town square that every neighborhood needs and that every neighborhood is proud to have. And just to add to that, I mean we are the anchor. I mean, we are the stable force. We're the information source. Uh, we're the ones who are out there really that people, as you all know, trust us and trust our word and trust what we do and trust the information we provide. And any type of cut then cuts into that as well. And to me, the unique balancing act that we've been able to Form as a result of the support of the city council and you chair and the majority leader and the speaker and also the administration uh, has allowed us to try to find that safe space in making sure we give the information that are available to the public in a variety of different ways. And as we move into 2021, especially with the onset of the vaccine and what may happen in making us all safer in society, to have libraries not to be available to them or have their doors open or to limit the number of hours we're serving, I think is a disservice to the public. And the other piece that I think is extremely important as far as uh, what we do is that we give people that information. And so when you have a debate taking place around the vaccine, when you have black and brown communities who may not for rightful reasons be as trusting as the vaccine, where are they going to go to? They're going to come to the library to get information, and that is our role to do that. And then the other thing, just going to what Linda talked about around the staffing issues and the staffing patterns, it will create chaos, quite frankly, because I lived some of this when I was chancellor in the whole bumping procedure and seniority and what it means and bumping staff and then all the new type of models we have to put in place that creates the confusion and we cannot afford to do that. And so we have been very lucky. We've been very blessed in being able to maintain what we do and keep our doors open to some extent. Uh, but that will be challenged as we move forward if there are further cuts or cuts to the budget itself. I'll just, uh, Dennis and Linda have already said it more eloquently than I can. It's pretty simple. You know, we, um, we put safety first, that costs money, right? We have prioritized not laying off our full-time staff. Um, we know that we can't provide the same services without our staff complement. And we know from a decade ago that when we have to do layoffs as the libraries did, the, the, you know, it takes us a decade to recoup the morale, the expertise, the momentum. We don't want, we don't know, it isn't that we don't want to have to do that again. We, we must not do that again. Look, it's real simple. When this, when we are back physically able is exactly when the city is going to need us the most. Mm -hmm. Right. If I, you know, I'm no epidemiologist, I, you know, it's, but you, it's pretty obvious that when we, when the city reopens, when the health issues, the, the, you know, all of it reopens and it, who knows exactly what that will look like and how smooth it'll be and exactly when that's when people are going to be running to the library for, Oh my God, how do I get my kids back up to speed? How do I, you know, supplement what they were doing at school or what they need to. How do I, you know, find a job? How do I get the skills for the job? How do I figure out, as you said, Jimmy, you know, whether to take this vaccine or, or you know, or who to vote for for the next mayor of New York? All that's going to be happening, right? We're the most trusted place. If 
we get through this awful period only to find ourselves cratering in our ability just when we're coming out of it, we will double down on the pain, right? That, that's, you know, that's just, we can't do that, please. Yeah, well, uh, obviously you know how I feel uh, about this. And uh, uh, before I wrap up, Linda, I just wanted to say your, uh, uh, Dan and I uh, took a rare trip to Brooklyn. Uh, you know, we, we love all three systems equally, <laughs> but we, we have a strong preference for the borough of Queens, but we did take a recent trip to Brooklyn uh, and uh, we're standing outside uh, on the plaza and turned around and saw the giant uh, BLM uh, sign uh, adorning uh, your beautiful uh, Central Library and uh, made me very happy that uh, uh, BPL uh, was so visibly supporting uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and uh, made the trip to Brooklyn, you know, that much better. Um, but we did rush back to Queens, Dennis, to make sure. That we had, yeah. <laughs> before, you, before, you broke out, before you broke out in hives, you had to rush back to the, to the homeland. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and, and we love uh, uh, New York Public Library as well. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, obviously, uh, uh, what you all have talked about today and, and the city of New York should be grateful that uh, millions of people have had the ability to turn to you uh, in this moment when uh, everyone was afraid uh, and everyone was struggling and no one knew exactly uh, from one day to the next uh, how they would be in terms of their health or the people they love. Uh, and yet, just as it has been for over a hundred years, our public library systems were there. Um, were there for uh, the people of the city of New York in, in ways that we could never have uh, imagined. And, uh, you know, I have, I have been inside uh, plenty of times, uh, Ozone Park and Kew Gardens Hills and Lefferts uh, as they existed as libraries to walk through them as, as COVID testing uh, sites is a, a surreal experience. Uh, but, uh, but I'm grateful that, uh, that they're there uh, and that those buildings are um, being used in that way because people trust them. So uh, first and foremost, I wanna lift up the staff of the three public library systems uh, who uh, I have, uh, as Dennis knows, visited when, when the, uh, the libraries in my area have reopened and, and we've gone. Um, they are heroes too. Uh, and they are doing amazing things. I particularly want to thank Dennis uh, for talking about custodians, who, uh, as you know, I, am, uh, I was raised by a school custodian. So it is uh, incredibly important for us to recognize those workers who rarely get seen, <laughs> right? We, see, we often see the product of their work in the form of a clean floor or a clean bathroom. Uh, but we don't see them. Uh, and it's incredibly important uh, that you did that, Dennis. So thank you. And, um, and you know, I hope we've demonstrated uh, very clearly just how much work is going on, just how uh, intensive uh, the services uh, are that you're providing, uh, that you're more essential than ever, and that we as a city have to protect uh, and enhance public library service uh, now uh, through the end of this pandemic and beyond. So uh, with that, I just wanna say thank you uh, to the three of you, uh, to uh, your staff members, uh, and obviously most importantly to the frontline uh, staff members in the local libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, committee council, if there are no other uh, questions or comments, we are adjourned, correct? Correct. Thank you, Chairman Bramer. Thank you. You just teased uh, out three times. I am gaveling out three times with the Bryan High School owl. One, two, three. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you.